Welcome to the show, Ken. Nice to have you here yet again. And yes, I am very interested in finding out how Canada compares to the U.S. in terms of voting. Well, Canada is very different, but but to me, uh, when you talk about voting, you have to start with your definition of democracy. You know, I like to think that the the purpose of voting or voting and democracy go together. You know, democracy is, um, you know, by simple definition, uh, ruled by the majority, you know, well, or ruled by whoever gets to vote. And if they get to vote fairly, and if they get to vote, if they're informed and so on. So you have to kind of get, um, you know, what are the key parts of democracy and voting that, that you need as prerequisites to assess, you know, voting in one country compared to another. Certainly the United States has a better voting system than Russia or Iran. You know, um, but everything is kind of in degree. You know, Russia claims their voting is democratic, <laughs> and so does Iran. <laughs> um, well, so, so, uh, so does so does Turkey. And I am really wondering about whether things were on the uh, straight and narrow in Turkey just a couple of days ago. It, well, I think it's similar to Hungary. Not maybe a little better, maybe a little worse. I don't know the the details, but but really, you kind of need, you know, are the voters educated and informed? Well, if you take a first example, U.S. versus Canada, if the only news and information for a federal election that an American gets is on the Fox. Um, oh, I'll call it propaganda channel because I have trouble describing it as news because it, it isn't really news. Um, you know, it's such a bias that that you really don't have an informed voter. You know, so your voting doesn't mean much. Your democracy is less democratic. Yeah, don't forget about radio. You get Sinclair Radio with 300 stations across the country, and they all um, they all have the same propaganda on them, uh, and they're all right wing, and, uh, and that's just as bad or possibly worse for large stretch large stretches of the hinterland uh, in this country. So it's not only Fox News and Newsmax; it's other media too. And if they listen to one, they probably you know stay in the other to be part of that bubble. Um, but the reality is they are not uh, educated about the truth. And you can't have democracy. You can't have um, full and fair voting if you don't have an educated citizenry. Well, there's education and being informed about the issues and the candidates. Well, then you, you also have, you know, are the voters able to mobilize and and work together to you know, try to help campaign, like how does your campaigning work? You know, like campaigning in, in Canada, they, uh, most campaigns are limited in the length of time. You know, you really have about 60 days maximum during which all of the campaigning is done. You know, they had a provincial election in Alberta that one of the made provinces in Canada that was very hotly contested and and where it's the province that most fights the federal government for everything under the sun. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but that, um, you know, there was only about uh, 45 days for all of the campaigning. Let, let's stay with that for a minute. If I were part of the uh, national American media, I would say that's not enough time I'm, I'm really asking for your reaction. That's not enough time um, to inform the citizenry. Um, Canada should have long campaigns just the way the United States does. We have the benefit of examining the candidates in great detail over a period of time and testing them and let people see, letting people see how they conduct themselves. And this is valuable to the public uh, in terms of informing the public even about the gestalt of a, a candidate, you know, how does he deal under the lights and the, the heat of a debate and so forth um, versus uh, 
a, a, a limited period of time where you really don't get to know him. So sure. some of the media sure. will yeah. argue with yeah. that. Some of the media will say uh, it's better to have long campaigns. And, you you know, in this country, we have canes that, campaigns that start on the day of the previous uh, 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 election. And so uh, that's, there's a real issue there about how much money you spend on these campaigns. Comment? Pardon me laughing at your generalization. I couldn't help but think of George Santos in the context of everything you just said. <laughs> you know, that is, you know, the the party selection in the U.S., you know, leaves no other choice. And, the, and you know, there's um, in Canada and the U.S., there's very much voting for the party rather than voting for the candidate. Um, but uh, so what's know, the benefit it, of having a short election cycle? I mean, a short campaign period. Well, uh, you know, are you talking an election for a president? or for a congressional person or whatever. Like in your US in the presidential thing, you know, you're picking the uh, the runner, usually the president's running again. You know, you very rarely seem to have um, two candidates, neither of which was, is the residing president. But in Canada, uh, the parties, the leader of the party is elected by the party members that have been in turn elected, you know. So your your leader of the opposition in the Canadian Parliament or in the British or Australian Parliament, um, everybody knows about them because of the way they behave in opposition and what they have to say. I mean, if you're informed and you're watching a reasonable newscast, uh, but. Um, you know that, that sort of the first item in in that regard is is really there. But what uh, that campaign period is one thing, but another factor that affects uh, voting is registration. You know, in Canada, registration is uh, is a non-existing item almost because if you pay income tax or you have a driver's license. You get automatically registered. If you, your immigration uh, department, you know, has a similar type of automatic feature, um, so that, and you know, we have no rules about you cannot register if you blah blah blah. I mean, if you're a Canadian citizen, uh, you can vote. Period. I mean, even uh, prisoners, like people that are in prison, can vote. The U.S. prohibits uh, prisoners, even if somebody's got some minor change for, you know, you know, insulting their wife so harshly that they got penalized for abuse or whatever. Um, the uh, you know, we even allow the worst of criminals to vote. Hmm, very interesting. Um, so, how does it turn out? Well, it, oddly, you know, that's one item that Canada's weaker on than the U.S. Like the U.S. Uh, makes such a fuss about registration and makes it so difficult to register and very difficult to vote. Like like you'd never see, you know, a lineup at, at a Canadian polling station, no matter what the election is. Uh, you know, unless there's like a hailstorm or something going on, <laughs> um, the uh, like the U.S. So that we have more voting places to vote, and you can vote early, and you you can even register to vote on the day of you're going to vote. You know, if, if you're so not you don't have all that uh, politicization of voting as a, as a right. Uh, you don't have a, a provincial legislate legislatures uh, making rules that are uh, racist in nature and to try to suppress voting. I assume, by the way, in asking that, I assume that the, um, uh, the, the various provinces do have some legislative control over who can vote? No? No. Actually, for a federal election, the federal government um, decides, period. How about and, the, how about the provincial really, election? 
at the provincial, each pro province does their own, but they really piggyback on the federal system and the federal voter registration system. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> well, you really have uh, oh, a variety of different things where, you know, the provinces uh, don't really have much role in determining the districts. When you have a provincial election, they get to, you know, set the um, some of the particulars. However, uh, they don't get to gerrymander the districts and they and they don't get to restrict who can vote you know and they don't get to restrict uh who the candidates are that uh, you know can run against the party in power um you know really the you know in the united states where the the state legislatures tend to be setting the districts you get ridiculous gerrymandering now, Canada resets their electoral districts, whether it's for mu municipal, federal, or, or provincial every 10 years, as does the U.S., but, but we have an independent commission that appoints independent people to do set the, the voting districts, and then a district isn't really set finally until after public hearings have been held and they, and they have significant adjustments based on whatever the public hearing uh, results in it, it, it's you know it's a much fairer system uh, well it's not politicized right now uh, you know i take the concept of gerrymandering you go a, a couple steps further the concept uh, like the us senate you know, is really not very democratic. You know, when you have uh, Wyoming with the same number of senators as California, you know, where California has, I don't know whether it's 60, 70 times the population. Um, and so that you really end up where you can have and the U.S. now does have what I call the rule by the minority. Yeah. Um, so the, the the whole thing about the Senate and the and the two the two seats per state um, is, that doesn't exist in Canada. No, um, the senators in Canada are appointed by the existing government. You know when there's a vacancy. So you can say, well, gee, they'd pick some friendly party guy. But the first choice is always the ex-premier of a province, you know, mm -hmm. or the ex-attorney general of a province. You know, so, you know, in, in the U.S., you know, if you took former governors, you know, there's some fantastic governors like, you know, the governor of Washington state, you know, is just what a gem. I mean, <laughs> I liked him as a candidate for president, but uh, uh, the um, you know that's that's what most of our senators are. You know they have phenomenal political experience by running something, and and it's just and it's the same as the British system. You know where they started with it called the House of Lords, you know, and then they kind of inherited the title. But after a while, it, it really be, they they became uh, similar to the Canadian ones. Um, well, what about <clears throat> candidates who have had run-ins with the law? What about some of these, um, you know, uh, governors of the of the provinces who may have been indicted, tried, who knows what? Um, do they disqualify or can they run also? I don't know of any Canadian premier having ever been indicted. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you really have, in a sense, historically, Canada's had more honest politicians than Americans. We have no Spiro Agnews in our closet. We have no, you know, Richard Nixon's, uh, you know, we don't have any Donald Trumps. We have some maybes, you know, like people, the, the premier that just got elected in Alberta, 
you know, that uh, she, this is a, a lady, um, and she had, um, uh, the previous premier retired when it was through, well, his term was not finished. So, of course, the the elected representatives got to elect from their members who would be the premier of Alberta. And this gal was premier for less than a year. And then, you know, the time for an election was, you know, where she had to restamp. And, and it was supposed to be a little closer than it turned out to be. But it was a case where the press very correctly said, you know, She's a little bit too Trumpish. It's a question of whether they're going to vote for the party, despite who the leader is. You know, but the leaders in Canada don't have quite the same power as they do in the U.S. Are there are there contests, Ken? Like, for example, you know, and a lot of this comes out of Trump anyway. You know, I want to revote. I don't believe the you know the 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 data. I don't believe who. Who you say won? Uh, I want to go to court. I want to go to the Supreme Court and contest every step in the system because I I believe that the only person that could have won this election is me. Uh, do you ever have that? Um, we have challenges, but only when they're really, really, really close voting tally, and it's really to require revote. That's it. I, I don't know of any, you know, objections like, uh, you know, we've had the U.S., but of course, everybody in the world is is learning from, you know, Bolsonaro and Trump and, uh, you know, and the guy in Pakistan, uh, Imran Khan, yeah. uh, you know, saying, you know, well, if I lost, there must have been some problem. Yeah. Yeah, you know. they are. They're learning from Trump. And I, you anticipated my next question. My next question is, so here you have um, Canada and the people in Canada who have a certain culture around voting and democracy, and we can examine that also. Um, but they look across the border and they see this craziness happening in the U.S. about people, you know, people having their votes suppressed, about um, having state legislatures do visibly racist things to prevent um, certain groups from um, voting. Uh, you have all these contests and all the denials of the validity of the system. They must look across the border and, and have a certain reaction. When I say they, I mean you and your friends and the people you talk to. What is the reaction of the Canadian you know, citizenry about what, is, what has been happening in the U.S. on, on these voting issues? Uh, the outlook's very negative toward, towards <laughs> U.S. attitude of suppressing who can vote and, and the discrimination. But you, one of the things that's important in that regard is to put in context that uh, the U.S. has a lot of racial problems because you're sitting where I don't know whether it's nearly 50% of the U.S. population is either brown or black. You know, in Canada, um, I think our our largest non-white uh, people are still the Native Indians. Like, like it's only less than 5% of the population. So we don't have enough non-white people to create the same racial mess. But no, you have you have diversity, you have been diverse, accepting, tolerant of um, you know, of immigrants much more than the US has, at least in recent years, say after World War II. And uh, you know, Canada is filled with different cultures, languages, diversity. Uh, and it's one of your great points. We've talked about that. So um you know I I just wonder uh uh, are you saying that that diversity uh, in all of its um, you know, issues uh, does not lead to uh, racial prejudice? Well, the various machinations that give rise to prejudice, uh, you have to put in the context that for the most part, Canada gets to pick its immigrants. You know, the, the you know, United States, when you think of slavery, 
you started with the black population. You didn't allow them in for the purpose of being normal voting citizens and with equal rights. You know, they were just there. Now, you have a lesser native population than we do proportionally because, you know, you just wiped most of them out. Um, <laughs> the, the Trail I, I, of Tears, the, the yeah, Cherokee well, Indians, for example. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't matter how you describe it. We had some massacres, but not not to the same degree, especially in places like British Columbia. Um, now, you also have, you know, the um, the brown population are mainly, you know, the Mexican and South Americans that, um, you know, are pushing at the border, but they're, they're you know, very large in number. You know, you, you have 60 or 70 million Hispanics, you know, and similar number of, uh, of Blacks. You know, where we really just don't have that. I mean, in the um, city I live in, probably the largest minority other than natives, like we have a pretty good native population in British Columbia, but we're probably um, Punjabi, you know, from Indian Pakistan. Um, you know, and they're, they're great citizens, but, you know, we got to pick them. Like, like they applied for immigration. They were normally, a, you know, a well-to-do family in India and well-educated or whatever. Like we have a medical profession, you know, is just loaded with uh, doctors from India and Pakistan and and Bangladesh and any any place that could speak English, and particularly that used to be in the Commonwealth. Do they vote? Oh yeah. Do they do they hold political office and aspire to positions of political leadership? Tons of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yeah, it's you know like like the uh, most conservative. Like you you know, I think of the and ra negative racial things in the U.S. To me, they seem to be. Uh, more slanted for the Republican side or the small C conservatives seem to be the most racial. Well, Alberta is the most um, conservative province in Canada, or it in Saskatchewan, or it flip up. I mean, they're they're in the same league of uh, Texas for most things, and and yet the most conservative city was Calgary. You know, it's about a million and a half people. And they had a um, uh, a mayor that was gay and a Muslim and overweight. <laughs> you know, like 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 if you if you get a picture of somebody, you know, they, you'd have you know the handsome guy like Bill Clinton. You know, is is a favored candidate mainly because they look like a nice person, like. You know, movie star Ronald Reagan or Clint Eastwood would get elected more easily than somebody who's, you know, not, you know, physically attractive. Uh -huh. This reminds me of a, an article in the paper about a small town in Germany, which, um, you know, has had racial problems and has had since uh, around 2015 or so, um, you know, huge numbers of migrants coming in and being welcomed, you know. And um, in this small town, which is, small towns are conservative, and this small town was conservative, there was a young uh, migrant, Syrian, as a matter of fact, uh, who decided to run for mayor of this town. And he was a you know, nice-looking, happy-looking, articulate guy. He had mastered the language and all that. He ran for mayor, and he won handily. And he's now the mayor of a small, conservative German town. So maybe maybe we're into something here. Maybe things are changing. Maybe Canada is on the forefront um, to allow people who are essentially cultural minorities take office. Yes. Uh, I mean, you've got a vice president. You know, mm -hmm. like that, that's pretty outstanding. Uh, yeah. You had a president that was black. Yeah. 
um, you know, so, you know, there's possibilities. Like I, you know, I think of the German one reminded me of when I was at uh, the University of Alberta many, many years ago. And, and there was only, to my knowledge, only one black student in the entire university. Wow. And he ran for an office. Yeah. And everybody voted for him just to prove they weren't biased. <laughs> okay. There you go. It, uh, there you go. We, we have it lived in interesting times. Yeah. Like, was it an opposite reason? Not because he was the best candidate or, or, or. It was simply to show, you know, that we're not discriminatory in the University of Alberta student body at that time. I want to examine one more thing with you, Ken. Early on today, you said uh, that the, you know, the the turnout is not that great, not not as great as you might hope, and and certainly we have problems in turnout too. People are really turned off by what happens. And there's another phenomenon, and I want to see if we can connect them. And the phenomenon is the Canadians look across the border and they see all this trouble, um, and it affects them uh, not only in terms of their philosophical reaction, you know. Uh, or their emotional reaction, but also in terms of, you know, making their own arrangements, making their own institutions, um, um, you know, taking political paths, what have you. So my question is, why is the turnout low in Canada, which is so diverse and so tolerant? Why is the, the turnout low in Canada? Um, in the face of that, you would expect it to be much better. You, I would expect you to tell me that, oh, the turnout's great. People care about government. They care about participating. They, they care about democracy. Um, but at the other, the other side of the coin, I say, well, maybe they look south over the border and they say, hmm, maybe we, we should get some of that virus, the Trump virus, and be turned off by the voting system, and therefore we don't care. Uh, is there that? Why do they not turn out in droves? Well, uh, the turnout is not much different than the U.S. That is, in Canada, I think you have about 98% of the people who are 18 and over, you know, in eligible, you know, whatever demographic you could describe to say they they could possibly, they could legally be a voter. You know, about 98%, you know, are registered to vote. But really, only a little less than 70% actually turn up to vote on most elections. And, you know, using a federal election in particular was where I saw something like 68%. Where in the United States, because of so many restrictions on getting registered and, and everything else, you really only have less than 70% of people who are of the age to vote are actually registered to vote. And, and I don't know in the US, when you get a voter turnout percentage, whether it's the percentage of those who are registered to vote or the percentage of those that are 18 years of old and if they were in Canada or Britain would be able to vote. Mm, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer. I can tell you that in Hawaii, uh, we have uh, really dismal figures on turnout. And uh, the last time I looked, it was like 40%, which is ridiculous um, for, you know, a state which is, uh, you know, otherwise progressive and, and uh, to find out they don't care. And, and it, you can't have the same quality of government with a low, a low turnout. That, that's my view of it. And the question I put to you finally is, what's the dynamic on this, Ken? Which way is it going? Uh, all the things, you, all the factors you talked about, is it is it getting more democratic, a better educated citizens, citizenry? Is it getting mm, higher turnout, uh, getting more tolerance, uh, more acceptance of everyone to vote, or is it the other way? Well, I tend to think it's the other way. I, I kind of list of what are the reasons why the public is apathetic? Well, if you watch Jim Jordan, you know, just say that's such a disgrace. How could 
how could Ohio even contemplate them? I mean, why is why isn't he impeached? You know, for uh, uh, you know, from the Ohio caucus or whatever it is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Ohio Republican Party is is just you know um, now the U.S. political result, you know, such as this vote on the uh, debt ceiling, you know, like the public must be, like I use the term, American public seems to be dumber than the Canadian public, even about U.S. affairs. I mean, I could talk to, you know, my nearest 10 neighbors and absolutely every one of them would know that the U.S. debt ceiling, um, you know, really is not the same as what the Republicans are asking for in, in budget cut or in cuts. You know, the, the debt ceiling has nothing to do with the budget. You know, the neck, those are the debt ceiling is last year's expenditures, which Trump and friends approved most of or the last, you know, 10 years worth. They certainly yeah. contributed to the deficit. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, I still think, though, that the Canadian voter apathy um you know, it's really, the you know, well, does my vote really make a difference in what's going to happen? You know, they're, they're going to fumble along anyhow. Now there's less um, self-enrichment in the Canadian, from Canadian politicians, you know, and, and we've had some recent scandals that, you know, you know, Canadian prime minister indirectly you know, was, you know, um, you know, somebody was paying his mother to give speeches. <laughs> uh, and uh, <clears throat> anyhow, though, the, the apathy towards um, the voting is, you know, there now, you know, in one election, like, you know, in British Columbia, where it's a, a fairly close provincial race, your turnout's much better. You know, because people think, well, gee, my vote may make a difference. Yeah, that's that's so interesting that you have, um, you know, the 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 way the press presents it affects the turnout. I guess we always knew that, but it's troubling if the press is not presenting an accurate picture, and that enhances the turnout. There should be a, a turnout intrinsically by people who care, who are informed. Well, Ken, thank you very much. This is an interesting comparison. I must say, um, uh, in 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 the comparison, I am in in no way more optimistic about the direction of the American experience. Um, but but hopefully, understanding the difference uh, will help some people understand there there is a better way. Dr. Ken Rogers, retired businessman in Kelowna, Canada. Thank you so much. Ours isn't perfect, but it's better than yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.